Well, welcome everybody. I just want to start out by saying I love this place. Uh, this has been an amazing weekend already, and uh, we had a, a, a DeSoto County Dream Center work day. We've had the season of giving, so many things, but I want to tell you that I love the way that God loves through you. I love the way that God serves through you, the community. I love the way that God gives through you at Life Fellowship Church. So every campus, if I could just give you a hug right now, this is what it would feel like. Mm, I love this place, and I love you. In fact, let me just share something with you. Last week, I told you that through the season of giving, uh, we actually provided about what is worth $40,000 worth of, of care bags for all the prisoners in Parchment and all the inmates at Henning that we have access to. Well, let me tell you, on top of that, you picked up over 1,000 gift tags and gift cards and provided for uh, the All is Bright God Behind Bars Christmas event and the children of, the, of uh, DeSoto Grace. You provided what is equivalent to about $31,000 in gifts. And I just want to say, as we welcome all the campuses, can you just thank God for his graciousness and generosity through your giving during this season of giving? It is amazing. And I'm telling you, it changes people's lives. It could be that you were able to provide a gift. And for the first time in a long time, a mother has been able to get a gift for herself uh, because she's always given to her kids. And this year, we took care of the kids. But I'm going to tell you, it means so much. And I thank you so much for being so generous and watching God give through you. Hey, if you're uh, just joining us, this is your first week. We're in our fourth week and final week of a series called The Book of James. So when you came in, you got a, a little announcement sheet on the other side of the notes. If you want to take that out, we're going to get started in this last week of this series. We're talking about faith. And uh, as you recall, James says this about faith. It is not just some type of theological construct by which you understand or ascertain how it is that you interact with God. But instead, our faith is meant to be something that is active, daily, and living in the way that we express it. In fact, he goes on in James chapter 2 and says, if your faith is not active and living, that it's actually dead. And that might be something that we need to heed here in America, as George Barna, who is a Christian pollster and researcher of American Christianity, has said that two-thirds of Americans actually their faith is more likened to those who have no faith or those who live of a different faith than it is the faith of the Bible. How many of you know that's a problem? That, that is that there are a lot of people who are, have the creeds and have the dogma and know the doctrine of the Christian faith, but their lifestyle is something different. They don't live what it is that they profess. And so James sort of pulls us back in the center. He says, faith without works is dead. And I love the book of James for a number of reasons, but one is that when he describes faith, he doesn't describe it using the heroes and the heroines of the Old Testament, talking about moving mountains and split, splitting the Red Sea, even though that is a portion of our faith we need to get a hold of. Don't get me wrong. He talks about faith in our daily active life as a part of our conversations, as a part of the way that we handle tests and trials, as a part of the way that we treat one another like we talked about last weekend. And then this weekend, we're going to end talking about how our faith should affect our tongue and the way that we interact with that. In fact, if you'll turn to chapter 3 of the book of James, you'll notice at the top there of the chapter in many of our, our Bibles, it says something like this, controlling the tongue or taming the tongue. So we're going to look at the first 12 verses of chapter 3. If you don't have your Bibles, you can look on the screen. I'm going to be reading from the NLT and uh, I, I want you to, to, to tune in with me. I'm going to be reading and then talking and interrupting myself. So just hang with me as we walk through this third chapter, the first 12 verses. James says this, dear brothers and sisters, again, he's talking to the church. Not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, he says, we all make many mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. Right here at the very beginning, he talks about our tongue as being an indicator of everything else that goes on 
in our life. And he points to the fact and sort of sets up the fact that the next three verses, he's going to talk about the power of this tiny little member of your body and how disproportionately powerful our tongues are. How many of you know how much your tongue weighs? Anybody got an idea? Well, it weighs about two and a half ounces. Two and a half ounces is what your tongue weighs on average. How many know what the tongue of a blue whale, the largest mammal that's ever lived on planet Earth, weighs? Anybody know that? Okay, I'll tell you. It's about 5,500 pounds. Yes, it's a big old truck just slapped down on there in between his teeth. And and, and I'm going to tell you, though, as, as large as a whale's tongue is, a blue whale, it's not as powerful as the two and a half ounces that you have in your mouth. For the Bible says that you have the power of life and death here. A whale doesn't have that. Whales don't talk trash to each other. Your mom is so fat. That I don't, you know, whales communicate, but they don't, they don't talk trash. They don't use their tongue in the same way. Therefore, their tongues are not as powerful. And so James is saying, look, the tongue is disproportionately powerful. And he spends three verses giving three different illustrations to show you the power of this tiny little member. We're going to start in verse 3. The first is this, we can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. Here's the first illustration of how powerful the tongue is. That a horse that is about 1,500 pounds of pure muscle and snorting power can be controlled by a five-inch steel bit that's placed between its teeth, strategically placed to maximize its power so that the rider can steer and guide and even pull this 1,500 massive muscle to a halt. That's the power of a bit, and it's compared to that of our tongue. Our tongue is so perfectly placed in the members of our body. It's placed right at the place, at the spout, from where your intentions and your thoughts And your motivations of your heart come out, isn't it? It's powerful even though it's small. That's the first illustration. It's a bit. Look at four. Then he talks about a small rudder. Makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. Now, back in the first century, one of the largest vessels or the largest uh, building or, or the largest thing that they would have been able to build is a ship. It would have been one of the largest structures that they would see. So you think about the mass of a ship and then the power of the winds and the waves that push upon it. And yet, it's controlled by a tongue-shaped little wooden rudder that would be underneath the boat. And that's much akin to the power of, 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 of our tongue, that we're able to steer ourselves in the situations. We're able to steer ourselves into good situations sometimes with the power of our tongue, and sometimes we paint ourselves in the corner or we press people up against the wall with the power of our tongue. It has the power to direct things, although it's small, like a rudder to a ship. And then fourth, uh, thirdly, rather, this is the third illustration in verse 5. He says, in the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. I don't know how many of you have been following the California fires, but every year they seem to get worse and worse as one little spark started possibly from a campfire that has floated through the woods and landed on some parched brush can destroy hundreds of thousands of property and natural resources and generations of houses that have been built, all starting with a tiny little spark that drifted through the air. And you know what? Our words, he says, our tongue is like this little spark. It can destroy years and years of relationship. It can destroy trust and security with just a breath. Think about it. Just one comment can travel through the internet, can travel through social media, and set ablaze a relationship or a situation. Just one little spark can can start and fly through generations. And people remember what granddaddy did and how my dad treated my mom and some things that he said or she said. They remember that. It doesn't go away. It burns through generation. It burns through times. That's the power. That's the power of our tongues. So he talks about it as being very powerful. But then look at what happens in verse 6. He turns and he says, And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It's a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. Now, he moves here not just talking about the 
the power of the tongue, though it is so small. But here he's talking about the problem of the tongue. And he gives us a couple of illustrations about the problem of the tongue uh, and the power that it has uh, as well. In verses 7 and 8, he says this, People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and is evil and full of deadly poison. So you see here in verses 7 and 8, the problem with the tongue is it can't be tamed. The problem with the tongue is that you cannot, through human will, Try to guide the tongue. It cannot be done by natural means. That's one of the problems with the tongue. And then he goes on to verses 9 through 12 and tells us the second problem with the tongue. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. So blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble up, uh, bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you cannot draw fresh water from a salty spring. So here he says, here's the second problem with our tongue, is that many times out of the same spout come two polar opposite things, blessing and cursing. Blessing God and then cursing those who were made in the image of God. Now I want you to see and get a visual of what that would be like. This, what he's talking about here would be like is if you and I went into uh, the presence of a king and we told him how great he was and we praised him for his benevolence and his power and his majesty, and then on our way out of the king's presence while we're still in the palace, we saw a statue of his image and we took a bat and we bashed its head. That is praising, blessing coming out of one, and then out of the other comes curses toward the image of that which we just praised. You see, the tongue is powerful, disproportionately so, but it's also problematic. So to summarize verses 1 through 12, I think Proverbs could do it for us in a passage that you may know very well. Proverbs 18, 21, it says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. Life and death. Do you believe that? I want you to think about this for a moment, that everything that you see, and indeed everybody here, everybody watching right now, everything that has ever happened in history all began with a word. God said, let there be light, and there was. God spoke to that which was empty and void, and he said, let there be, and it was. And then God breathed into you and I the breath of life. And we were created as image bearers of God. So the intent was for you and I to have the same creative power in our words that the God whose image we bear had. You think about that for a moment. We, our words have that same type of creative power that spoke the worlds into it. Now, I'm not saying that you and I have the power in our words to speak a Cadillac into your driveway or a, a huge estate home onto your zero lot. That is not what I'm talking about. But what I am saying is that you and I, with the power of our words, have the ability to bring to life or to death relationships and situations in our life. And we can bring to life or death our potential and our future. Why? Because words have power. Power to inspire, to encourage, to lift up, to challenge, to affirm, to motivate. But they also have the power to cut down to deconstruct hope, to wound and destroy. Some of you, even right now, as I talk about the power of words, you may reflect on a conversation where you are absolutely berated verbally by a coach, a teacher, a spouse, a parent. Even though it's been years, you can remember some of the very words that they use because those words have framed your identity in some way they got a hold of an insecurity in you, and they began to shape how you view life and how you understood who you were in, in the context of life at large, and it affected you. You can still feel the sting and the embarrassment as you recall that memory of what happened to you, and there's power in that. And I want to tell you, Jesus even spoke about this in the Sermon of the Mount, the power of words. He says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, that if you curse another person, it's the same punishment, the same destructive power as that of murder. While you and I would stay far away from murder and adultery, and far away from all the other sins that are visible on the outside, many times we allow the sin of our words just to go unchecked. 
Husbands stab their wives with words that are sharp as daggers. And wives spew back a venom that cannot be retracted. Parents devastate their children with a, a barrage of words, an angry tirade in a moment that you may forget, but your child may never forget. Even churches can be decimated by people who just run their mouth, just gossip and lie, and just share, spare, spread rumors. It, it all starts with our mouth, and we need to understand the power of the tongue and the problem with the tongue. So how do we, how do we tame it? How do we draw this in? How do we rein it in? How do we bring our tongue under control when it's so difficult that the Bible even says that you can tame all sorts of animals? Every type of species, there's one animal in that species at least that has been tamed, but you cannot tame the tongue. Let's talk about it for just a moment. Okay, you got your hand out there. I want you to look in the first spot there, the first thing we got to do to tame the tongue. And this is the first thing you have to start here. Otherwise, you cannot do the other two. So the first thing that we've got to do is surrender control. Put that in your hand out. Con surrender control. Now you might say, surrender control of what? Well, let me ask you this. What determines whether blessing and cursing come out of your mouth? Is it the words you speak? No. You see, it's actually not the rudder that directs the boat. It's the captain. And it's actually not the bit or the reins that steer the horse it's the rider. In the same way, it's not your words that direct your tongue, but it's your heart. It's your heart. It's what's in your heart. That's why James says in verse 12 in chapter 3, listen, can, you, can a fig tree produce olives? And the answer is no. You can't hide what's on the inside. It will come out of your mouth. And what it reflects is your heart. As Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, it's in your hand out there, chapter 12, verse 33 Jesus said this, as a tree is identified by its fruit, if a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If it's bad, its fruit will be bad. Verse 35, and a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. But an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. So the answer to the question, how do I control my tongue, is to surrender your heart. Surrender your heart to God's will, to his way, and to his word so that what you say is consistent with your faith and not consistent with your circumstances. Amen? What is in your heart? Let it be consistent. I hear people all the time, and I've said it myself. Oh, my gosh. I didn't mean to say that. Oh, that just slipped out. You ever heard anybody? That, I, didn't mean, I didn't mean that. I wish I could take that back. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I was several years ago on a missions trip. We were supposed to go to Uganda. And uh, to Watoto, we have 15 people from our church with us. And my son, who was about 12 years old at the time. And we went to Atlanta, and we had a delay in Memphis. And when we got to the gate, they had just pulled out, and they left us. 15 people, when we were there on time, but they left us. I was, I was, ooh. It's a tough memory for me right now. I was so mad, I was embarrassed, because I'm leading this trip along with my wife, and here we are, we missed our flight, and we didn't even get out of the country. It was going to be two days before we could leave and get to Amsterdam. And even when we get to Amsterdam to go down to Uganda, we would all be flying in different planes. I mean, we wouldn't be going together anymore. I was so mad. These people had spent you know, a lot of time and energy and thousands of dollars to be on this trip, and now we're delayed two days. I was irate. I was, I was so mad, guys. I'm sorry. I just got to tell you, I was mad. I was embarrassed. I was mad at myself. So we're in Atlanta for a couple of days, and this just happened, and it's hot, and we're, we're walking from the hotel. We dropped our stuff off, and we're walking. I got flip-flops, and I'm out front, and my 12-year-old son is behind me, and he trips over a little crack in the sidewalk, and he steps on one flip-flop and pushes me at the same time, and my bare toe goes into a curb, a concrete curb, and it breaks. And I said, I said a word that rhymes with hit. Uh, I'll leave that for you to figure out. And, uh, I, I, and all the team is behind me, but my son, I think, was the only one that heard it. <laughs> I know some of you are going to leave the church. I'm sorry. Uh, but, uh, but what came out was, listen to me, what came out was in my heart. 
I was so mad. I was mad at the airline. I was embarrassed and mad at myself. I was frustrated about the situation I couldn't control. And, all, and, and it wasn't, you know, so when people say, oh, it just slipped out. No, no, no. It was in there. Oh, it, was, it was in there. And I'm going to tell you, if people weren't around, there was probably some other stuff in there. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. But, but the same is true with you. It's in there. It's in your heart. And it will come out when you get bumped by life. So the key is for you and I to do a heart inventory and find out what is in our heart. Because that's the key. Surrendering our heart, not your tongue. It's too late then. I couldn't reel that back in. And neither can you. And there's a lot more in there. And that's why Jesus said, again, we'll pick up in verses, it's in your handout, chapter uh, 12, verse 36. And I tell you this, you're going to give an account on judgment day for that, Patrick. For every idle word that you speak, your words will either acquit you or condemn you. So sometimes, I'll tell you this, the best response when life does push you and bump you is a closed mouth, right? Right? As, as Mark Twain says in your hand out there, a closed mouth gathers no foot. That's a good quote. That could be in the Bible. I ain't sure. But a closed mouth gathers no foot. You don't have to apologize when your mouth is shut. Proverbs 13, 3 says those who control their tongue will live long, but those who open their mouth could ruin everything. So we have to surrender our heart to God. We surrender ourselves on a regular basis. And one of the best ways that you can surrender your heart to God is close your mouth and open his word. The more that you and I close our mouth and open God's word, the more likely when we get bumped, what's going to come out is his truth and not our situation or interpretation of it. Amen? So the first thing we've got to do if we want to tame our tongue on a regular basis and take seriously what James says about the power and the problem of our tongue is we've got to surrender our heart and bathe it in God's word. Here's the second thing. You can only do this after you surrender God's heart. To you. You're going to find it difficult to do this on your own is to stop speaking death. We do this all the time in America. Part of our culture is to be uh, negative and to speak death rather than life. There's far less chance that we'll be wrong, we feel like, if we speak death or negativity rather than speaking life and take a chance, right? And, and, and everybody else is doing it anyway. Remember years ago, I used to do our uh, Discover class. And of course, we called it something different then. We were a church that was growing uh, but still relatively small compared to what we, uh, we are today. And as a result, in the community and uh, this is something just for church planters. Just know this. As you start your church, you plant your church, and you grow your church, a lot of people come from other churches that, that they've been problems at other churches, and they couldn't get away with it anymore, and they're going to come to your church. <laughs> and they're going to try and hijack the leadership and strong-arm you into their way. And, and we had dealt with that several times in the early years. And so I started teaching this class, and, and one, of the, one of the areas that when new people are in your church and welcome and visitors and, and they're coming to a class and we'll learn more about it. Uh, one of the things we always teach is our values. And so uh, we list our values, but I don't go through them. I say, hey, look, you can read these on your own, but the last value I am going to teach on for a second. And that is that a church should live and serve together in unity. That is uh, not that your ideas aren't good ideas, but understand this, we're all moving in the same direction. And we're all going to do what God tells us to do. And we're all going to do it in love. And we're not going to be divided. And we're not going to, we're not going to talk about each other. We're not going to allow uh, any kind of, 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 of uh, uh, disagreement to come between us for the sake of the church. And so I, so I was just teaching on this. And I teach this from Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, where the Bible talks about, listen, there are six things the Lord hates. No, seven that he detests. Seven things that God hates. And of, of, of seven of them, three of them have to do with the tongue. And, and, and they are, he, he hates lying, false witness, and sowing discord in a family. And so I talk about that. I say, look, you're not going to run your mouth here at Life Fellowship. <laughs> I, say, I say, we're not going to have gossip here. If I hear it, I'm going to shut it down. Understand, it's not about you. It's not about me strong-arming you. It's about unity of the body of Christ. He doesn't want his body ripped apart, and you ain't going to do it. I ain't going to allow it to happen. And uh, so I tell them down the front and just to scare them away is the key. You know what I'm saying? 
Uh, not that we're going to have an arm wrestling match, but the key was for them to understand that your words are going to be kept in check. And there's other people going to keep it in check because this is a serious thing to God, how you use your mouth. And we heard it from God himself. It's like, in, in, in Matthew chapter 5, it's akin to murder. So this is a serious thing. So if it's so serious, and we're so prone to speaking words of death, and it comes natural even in the church, then how do we prevent ourselves from doing that? Hey, here's, here's what you need to do. Uh, you need to stop and you need to think before you say anything. I, in fact, I want you to look at your handout. There's an acrostic that can help you to know whether you should respond or what you should do because, you know, look, lying and, and all that kind of, that's just a few things. There's slander. There's all sorts of cursing. There's all sorts of other ways you can use your mouth in the wrong way. So here's an acrostic that I just, I just heard about that I think would help you out, okay? These are five questions to answer before you respond. Somebody says on our staff, they're like, well, Pastor, how do I know if I'm passing gossip along? How do I know if, I, if what they're telling me is gossip? Well, here's a great way to know. If you can't do anything about it, then they've told the wrong person, and they're trying to spread gossip. Gossip should end with you. So you go to the person who can do something about it, and it's over, all right? So that's a good way to know, right? But here's, here's some ways to know whether uh, you're using your, your tongue in the right way. Uh, first of all, putting your blank there, is it true? If somebody comes to you and uh, there's, there's a question about what they've said or whether you should pass this along, you need to ask yourself, is it true? And there's sort of a rule of thumb with gossip is that the more salacious or, or intriguing it is, probably more likely it's false, okay? It ain't all, we ain't all that interesting, okay? Then secondly, is it helpful? If you're about to say something, you're about to respond, ask yourself, are your, your words going to bring a solution to this? Don't just blabber because you can. Don't just pass information along because you can. That's idle words, and you're going to give an account for that. But can your words actually bring help and bring conclusion to this issue? Here's another one. Is it inspiring? You ever thought about that? Are your words inspiring? I heard someone say it like this. Words are like an elevator. They can take people up, and they can bring people down. What are your words doing? Think about that. And then is it necessary? I mean, do you really have to respond at all? Do you have to say anything? Can you just keep your mouth shut? Would that not be the best thing to do? And then finally, is it kind? That is, can you bring encouragement? And, uh, and if you can't answer these questions uh, and with a yes, then, then do yourself and those around you and the church a favor and just don't say anything at all, right? And, but it doesn't just apply in the church. This applies in your personal life as well. You and I, before we begin to speak death, which is natural, okay, I'm just saying it's, it's a natural byproduct of the culture in which we live and the state in which we were born is to speak death. Before we do that, stop and think first, amen? And then here's the other one is start speaking life. You've got to start speaking life. And let me just tell you, I say this because this is not natural. This is a discipline. This is something you must train yourself to do. Many times we come in here and we, we worship and we sing and we praise God. And uh, maybe you are not participating in that. And you're coming and saying, I'm, I'm just waiting through the worship to get to the word because you're so spiritual. Can I tell you something? You're missing out on what God wants you to do and he wants you to hear. God wants to hear you singing his praises back to him. Have you ever heard yourself Sing God's praises back to him. I would encourage you. Don't be so spiritual and come here and say, but, Brother, I like the word, but I'm just not into the music. Well, get over yourself. It's not about the music. It's about worship. Amen? And you don't have to like the music, but you better like worshiping because that's all we're going to do in heaven. Amen? So get used to it. All right. <laughs> the other thing you can do is read God's word out loud. Don't just read it to yourself, but let yourself hear yourself reading God's word back to him, the praises of God or whatever it is. This is a discipline that you've got to get yourself into. But how many of you know it's easy for us to bless God, right? That's not the hard part. And that's what James talking about in verse 9. He says, with the same mouth, we bless God, and then we curse those who are created in his image. The, the hard part is not blessing God or singing praise to his mouth. The hard part is us blessing other people who are created in his image. And James says, my brothers and sisters, this should not be. 
Well, I'll speak for y'all back to James and say, James, let me tell you why this is. Because Jesus ain't the one that gives me an attitude. It's my kids. <laughs> It's not God that, that, that argues with me and, and, and whines and complains and grumbles. It's my spouse. It's not the Holy Spirit that, that, that embarrasses me or undercuts me at work. It's my coworkers. So let's just say it takes a whole other level of faith for me to bless those who are cursing me than it does for me to bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Amen? That's true, isn't it? So how do we do it? How do I appreciate and encourage and inspire people who take me for granted, who, who are insensitive to my feelings and my needs, who act in the exact opposite nature as to what God tells me I should treat them? How do I do it? Everybody say this with me wherever you are. Say this, by faith. Say it. By faith. That's how you do it. And can I tell you, that's how James says we're to do everything. That's how you endure tests and trials. That's how you treat people. That's how you pray in chapter 5. It's how you speak is by faith. You speak by faith those words of appreciation and encouragement and inspiration. You speak it by faith, not when they've earned it, not when someone deserves it, not when it's convenient to you, not when they're at their last straw and they're up back against the wall and they're discouraged and finally you come in. No, you do it by faith. Even when people don't treat you that way, even when they don't deserve it, even when no one else is doing it, you do it by faith because it is the word of God. It is his truth. It is life coming through you. God's trying to get his faith through you, through your words. Amen? We speak by faith based on who they are in Christ's eyes, not based upon their behavior as you understand it in your eyes. Because if so, you begin to speak death to people based on their behavior rather than speaking life based on what God says about them. Amen? Amen. So we've got to speak it by faith. Romans 1.17 says, the righteous shall live by faith. Again, some of you are worried about speaking things into existence. Listen, you've been speaking death so long into existence that, that you, you, it's time for you to speak life by faith. And in fact, look at your handout. If you don't start speaking words of life by faith, you will default to speaking words of death based on the facts that you see around you, just by nature of it. I'd encourage you through this Thanksgiving holiday season to speak life. And can I tell you, this is the best time of the year. Families are around, friends are around, people you haven't seen in a long time. It's the best time of the year to make some things right with your words. For you to encourage somebody, not because they deserve it, not because they've earned your favor, not because they're in right standing with you, but for you by faith to speak words of encouragement and love and appreciation to them. Because I'm going to tell you, during this season, people are stressed, they're anxious, they're fearful, they're insecure, they're discouraged, they're angry, they're depressed. They need words of life. Amen? Amen. I was just this past weekend, I, I pulled into a convenience store to get a, a drink, and I want to show you this sign, DeSoto CBD shop. That's not really the focus. The focus is, what do they say the CBD cures? Look at this. Pain, insomnia, anxiety, depression, nausea, migraine, seizures, addiction. Read that again. These are all the things the church should be curing. These are all the things, listen to me, that our words should be curing. I, I believe that our words of life could bring hope to people, could bring strength to people, could to do away with the anxiety and bring peace to people, could bring uh, desire and hope to their future, could, could, could kill the addiction. Of life. I believe there's some power in words, more than just saying it. The Bible teaches us it's true, but we've got to, by faith, speak words to people, encourage people, believe the best in people, speak by faith over people, about them, that they don't have the courage or the strength to speak in and for themselves. Amen? In fact, I want to show you the Bible teaches this. Proverbs 16, 24 says, kind words are like honey. They're sweet to the soul. Look at this. And healthy for the body. He's not just blowing smoke. I believe, and scientists are proving it more and more, that our words provide an incredible source of strength and hope and encouragement for us. 
This is a great opportunity for us to do it. And I want to speak for just a moment to the men and women that got behind bars. This holiday season, you may think you're all by yourself. You may look around and say, well, that's obvious. There's no one here. My family's not here. My memories are gathering in, in grandmother's living room and eating and celebrating. And, and you're, you're fearing that you're missing out on all these things because you're in a cell and you're isolated. I want to look in that camera. I want to tell you, God loves you. And you're not alone. He's there with you right now. You're valuable to him. You mean something to him. Your life is significant. He loves you. He loves you like you're the only one here for Christmas at all. I want you to know you're special and you mean something to God, something so much that he would send his son to this earth to die for you. God loves you and we do too. Amen, Life Fellowship. We love you. And let me say to those of you in this room, those who are watching right now, this may be a good season for you to allow your, your faith to train your tongue rather than your tongue has for so long led your faith. Maybe during this season you say, you know, there's some people, as I look at my family and where I'm going for the holidays that I need to speak life to. I usually get around with the guys in the room afterwards and we tell jokes and we share things. They're just words of death. And I'm not going to participate in that. In order for you to stop speaking death and start speaking life, you got to surrender your heart first. And so if you're here, you're one of the campuses and you've not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, this is a great opportunity for you to do it and there's not a better season. Amen? Would you right now, all of our campuses, would you bow your heads and close your eyes in this moment? I, I want to pray, but I, I want for those of you who say, you know what, I do need to get my tongue in check. I, I wonder why my faith has wavered and why my faith has not been as strong as it should be. I've wondered why it is that my marriage is, 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 is wavering and my kids are struggling in my life. And listen, I'm not blaming everything on your tongue, but I'll tell you this. That's where it all starts for a lot of you. If you're struggling in your faith in any particular area, do some heart inventory about the way that your faith, exer or your tongue rather, exercises your faith. Right now with your heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's you and you need someone to pray for you this morning, this weekend, would you just raise your hand and say, that's me. Just raise your hand. Just be real long. Thank you. Thank you. At every campus, Let's pray.